Okay. The actual process. Now we saw the direct mailer that went out. Um, we're going to use that as an example first. And I'll pull that one out as an, as an example. I know this is an inbound marketing class, but I wanted to help you guys tie that offline world with the in, inbound world or the online world. When we get to the end of this example, I'm going to show some online applications also, a full list of them. So we'll come back to that side here in a second. So we saw the ad, we saw the direct mailer, we saw the landing page, how folks get to us. And of course the landing page URL, we talked about that. Landing page URLs can be catchy, like this one we were talking about here. This, this direct mailer here, I probably should have told you this before I told you about the cool landing page URL. Um, this renters were targeted on this direct mailer. The, direct, the addresses that we got for Dragas were renters in the area. So we knew that it was people that could afford $1,100 a month mortgage because they were already paying more than that in rent anyway. So coming up with something like my landlord is crazy just made sense. It, so that's what we're talking about here. Landing page URLs do not have to be dragus.com slash pain relief. They don't have to be that long. The same URL, my landlord is crazy.com, points to that same landing page here. It points to the same page on the website as the long URL. So the landing page URLs, catchy, catchy. Think, get into the mind of your consumers and think catchy landing page URLs, which of course ends up on the landing page. So this is an example of a landing page. No navigation. Navigation is taken off of the website. The logo here does, if you click it and go, it'll go to the home page. So you're not totally trapping your users in. But what you're doing is making the information prominent and the web form, the web collection form on your landing page prominent because that's what you want people to do. You don't want them to do anything else. All of this information here, there are no links in here. No hyperlinks. There are no hyperlinks in here anywhere. The only thing for them to do is fill out the web form on this landing page. That's what we're going to do. Now, every once in a while, we'll get a new client of ours that says, you know, I'm not sure about that because we're going to have people come to our website and go to these pages, and that's just going to make them mad. You know, we have tons of pages on our website, and we, we want them to be able to get to that other content. But like I mentioned a minute ago, this is a targeted audience. This is an audience that came from here looking for this information, looking for this specific information and was already interested. You didn't have to sell them. Just take their information. You've got them sold right here. So that's why on a landing page, you want to make that web form very, so very prominent. There's two prominent. different conversion rates in inbound marketing that we worry about. Your marketing conversion rate, because it comes off of your ad campaigns and your marketing, and your marketing director, this is the conversion rate that they care about. The page views they got to this landing page because it came from an advertisement somewhere. Now think this advertisement could be an online banner ad. It could be you know any, any different ad medium. So your page views to your landing page, which came from the, the um, ad concept, and then the web form leads. So that conversion rate right here is what a marketing director is going to care about. Now in the old days, that's all the marketing team cared about. When they got this kind of conversion rate come out, they're washing their hands and they're going out on Friday and having a margarita somewhere. They were very, very happy because we're going to talk about it in a second. The vice president that sits over top of the creative team and the marketing team, and we're going to show you the sales team here in a second, didn't have that big overarching view of what works and what doesn't work and who's doing their job and who's not doing their job. They didn't have that back in the day. I'm saying back in the day, internet was five years ago. They didn't have that kind of information. So when your marketing director came up with this report right here at their monthly or quarterly meeting with their vice president, they were happy with that. That was awesome. So now let's throw the next piece in here and our sales team. So we have leads that are coming down here. So we got, what do we have, 500 page views and 50 leads. So those 50 leads in a month get thrown over to the sales team. And now our sales team they have this conversion rate. Now this is old, this has always been that way. Sales team, wherever it comes from, telephone, telemarketers, whatever, um, your marketing team, your sales team has leads that come in and they try to work these conversion rates. Now again, these are not real time numbers, I just rounded things off to make it, you know, so we could have even percentages. So your sales manager 
every month or every quarter would have this report right here. And they would have their own meeting with the vice president of advertising and sales, and, and they would have their sales conversion rate, and everybody's happy. They're washing their hands on Friday, and they're going out for their own margaritas, not even talking to these folks, knowing that's the end of the line. I got 50, I converted five. Think about that, selling homes, that's quite a bit. And our sales team's conversion rate was 10%. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Okay, well, let's, let's go. Let's figure out how that really works. So let's flatten the architecture back out. We have an ad campaign, we have a, a marketing team, and we have a sales team. And then we have leads over top of those. Usually there's a creative director over here that comes up with the concept. There's a marketing director over top of the marketing campaigns. And there's a sales manager that's over top of the sales team. And then we have their conversion rates, these two conversion rates that are never going away. So remember those, the formulas I showed a second ago, those are always gonna be there. And now we have this guy up here, or this lady up here, that now has overview of everything that's going on. Because she know, or he knows how much money was spent on this ad campaign, and now he knows how much money is made down here at the end on these sales conversion rates. And if this conversion rate doesn't match up, if, and, and the percentage is not high enough, that vice president knows that he can go marching down to the marketing department and get all in this guy's stuff and say, no, this is not working. And the marketing director can't blame it on the creative team anymore because we now know how many leads are coming off of these campaigns. And he can't also blame it on the sales manager and say, oh no, they're just not closing leads that we get to them because he now has oversight into these, um, these sales conversion rates. And we know by tracking the person that actually filled out this form right here and came in through that campaign either got sold or they didn't get sold and there's a dollar amount put on that person. And that person, each one of those little dollar amounts can get applied back to the original ad campaign. That makes sense? It really, if you think about it, it's kind of common sense. But before, we didn't have a way to measure any of this because you didn't know if this was an offline campaign and it didn't lead to a landing page, maybe there was just a phone number on there. We had no way of measuring those kind of leads. So the marketing director only had half the information and the sales manager had all the information, but he couldn't go back to him and say, or him and say, oh no, you're not doing your job. Or go back to the creative director and say, no, you're not doing your job. We couldn't do that before, where now we can. Make sense? Yes. So is inbound marketing similar to integrated marketing? I think the only difference probably is that it goes from offline to online. Is it the only direction that, that you follow or sometimes you kind of reverse those from online into other channels? Just give that a difference. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a great question. Um, there, there is a way for offline advertising, I'm trying to think if I have a graphic that I can get back to. Well, I can just start right here. Offline advertising, any of these mediums we talked about, print, let's just take print since that's the example I brought. Um, and if it didn't have an, a landing page on here to get us online into the online world, and it had a phone number. So the phone number stays offline, okay? So somebody answers the phone and, says, and a consumer says, hey, I'm interested. So they take their name and number and a sales guy calls them. So that all stays offline. It stays in that offline world. The tool set that I decided not to talk about today because we could talk about that forever, the tool set that sits underneath of all of this, we call it our marketing manager, our Jace marketing manager we provide for our clients. The tool set has a way to manually enter traditional leads that come in, offline leads that come in. So when a consumer calls the, a phone number, the person that answers the phone right here actually has pulled up on their console. They have to enter these, the information in some database somewhere anyway. So they enter it into the same database that this guy went into. It's just flagged as a traditional offline lead. So it stays offline because it gets handled offline. So if you take that process the way you're talking about, there's the consumer offline, there's a phone call taken, and there's a sales guy that takes care of the lead. But then there's that tool set down there, piece of software, a database, that handles all that information and they're put into the same database as everybody else. So what that does for you then is down here, 
when we're doing these calculations, these guys and the phone number guys are all in the same calculation. So we can still tell and we can still apply it so to that direct mailer. Whether the lead stays offline or the lead comes online getting trapped right here is really irrelevant now. We don't care because it all goes back to the ad campaign, and which is really all this guy cares about. They care about how much money we spent. All of our money is getting spent right here in the creative team. So all they care about is how much money it's spent and how many dollars came in. You have an Down ad concept, end. which is the whole concept. We feel your pain. Yeah. We feel your pain. So there's a concept there or a Valentine's concept. And then there's mediums, radio, television, outdoor boards, direct mailers, internet, banner ads, um, pay-per-click. Have you guys talked about pay-per-click? Any pay-per-click advertising? So that's just another medium, part of your ad campaign. So this one is a list of online content marketing. Remember we talked about strategic content on your website? Your website itself and the content and the lead generation forms all through your website, that's really an ad medium. So we treat it the same way. It brings in leads on its own through our new inbound marketing, old SEO, the new inbound marketing tactics. Content marketing is all in that. Social signals, we talked about that a few minutes ago. How we track social signals, if you go to our Facebook page, our Jay's Group Facebook page, there are links all over the place, but over in the little bio section where it has a link to your website, it actually doesn't go to the home page of our website. It goes to jaysgroup.com slash Facebook. And it's a landing page for people that came from Facebook. That's these social signals right here. So that landing page now, we can count these guys and we know that if we get leads coming in on that specific landing page, they came from Facebook or they came from Twitter or they came through our YouTube channel or they came from Pinterest or wherever they came from, we know where they came from. So it's just another ad medium to us. Search engine optimization, pay-per-click. Um, everybody know what pay-per-click is? Um, the ads on Google, yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, the ads on Google, the ads up at the top that sometimes bug the crap out of you and take up half your screen space, and then the ads over on the right-hand side, or I guess over here for you guys, on the right-hand side, that's pay-per-click advertising, and the name is there because when you advertise, it's free until people actually click on it, and when you click on it, you pay a certain dollar amount. The company that's advertising pays, so it's pay-per-click. And those can get kind of expensive, so if you ever get somebody you're mad at, just start <laughs> clicking, no, not really. Um, but they can get kind of expensive. We've had some pay-per-click ads that were up until the $14, $15 per click. So they can get kind of expensive. <clears throat> but they're very efficient. Um, we find them to be very effective for brand new websites and brand new ad campaigns to get things kick-started while the whole process of SEO and content marketing and the spiders are coming out and getting all your information. Pay-per-click is a fast way to start getting leads running through your internet marketing. Email marketing, email campaigns. Email campaigns, as much as people like to talk trash about spam and email, email marketing is still very big and it's still very efficient. The returns on a quality email marketing campaign is very high. Um, so I doubt they'll be going away for a long time. And a lot of times I, I said a quality campaign because a quality campaign has to do with your database uh, your list of names and email addresses also. So if it's folks that have actually opted into your list, they want to get your information anyway. So you're already ruling out that they think you're spam. And then social bookmarking. Do we know what social bookmarking is? Dig, Delicious, Reddit. Do we know any of those? <coughs> oh, good, good. Um, social bookmarking is very big. Um, I. I get questions about social bookmarking a lot, but I'm not a social bookmarking person. So I don't understand the mentality of dig.com being my homepage versus google.com or bing.com. I would rather go to bing.com or google.com, but there are millions of people all over the world that dig.com and reddit.com and stumbleupon.com is their homepage. And that's where they get all their information from. And honestly, for our website, our jacegroup.com website, Stumble upon is the largest, by far, refer to our website. I don't know why, um, it almost doubles Google's traffic. Um, so it's really kind of odd, but 
Um, I will say the conversion rates are not as high. It's more folks exploring the web, I guess, um, at least in our industry it is. I just have a comment. It's an interesting observation, too, because um, my website is not really on StumbleUpon too much, but um, right. when it was actually got onto StumbleUpon, that became like a major traffic source yes. on my website, too. Yes, it did. Yeah, I can believe it. I can believe it. And remember going all the way back when we had these columns of information running up and down, one of those was inbound links, social bookmarking websites, just for selfish reasons, is a great place to go and get tons of inbound links coming back to your website because they get so massive. That's, what, that's how StumbleUpon actually works. Somebody sees it and they like it and then it gets on their page and so you get all these hundreds of thousands of links coming back to your website. And now we'll move offline. Telemarketing, it's a bad term. People don't like to hear it. We hate telemarketers, but it's very effective, very effective. Um, television commercials, radio spots, trade shows, kind of going out the door because of the expense of trade shows. But in some industries, we have a couple of clients in their industry, trade shows are huge and they're not going away. Some of the tech industries, trade shows are very big and they're not going away. Techies are still going to go to conferences and going to go to trade shows. Um, print advertising and outdoor boards. And we treat all of these the same. Even telemarketing, because of the tool we were talking about where folks can call back in and we still get them in the database, we can still apply a dollar amount, a head count on lead sales sold based on telemarketing leads that came in. So even though all of these are offline, they get wrapped back into the same calculations into our inbound marketing system. So this would be a good place to reiterate that inbound marketing is not all internet marketing. It's marketing and advertising in general. It wraps all of that back into the same, the same um, calculations, which this guy loves. So kind of makes a little bit of common sense. Now remember we talked about these brand monitoring, analytics research, ROI calculations. We've hit on this a couple of times now already. We can now apply dollars to both a new lead that came in and we can apply dollars to a new sale all the way out in the process. Now, why would you want both? You want both because you can tell what part of the process is working. We can apply dollar amounts to the amount of leads that come in, but if there are a lot of leads in that marketing conversion rate that's coming down the middle, if that conversion rate's high and your sales conversion rate is not high, there's a problem somewhere in the process. Either the leads are not quality leads, and in that case, then we go back to our creative team and say, hey, you got to do something with these campaigns. You're getting all of the smart asses in here, but you're not getting people that are actually interested. So that's good information for your creative team to know. They won't do that again if it's not working. Or you have a problem with your sales team. And then you can talk to your sales manager and say, what's going on, man? Why aren't you closing leads? We need to know what's going on. So we need to be able to apply dollars to both of these. That's very easy to do now, where we couldn't do that before. And then re-engagement planning, we talked about that. We can now measure all these results and change. Think about that. If we know every month or every other month or every quarter that this worked but this didn't, did not work, that's a big expense that we don't have to spend every month. If direct mailers are not working, we don't have to have print charges. We don't have to have U.S. postage charges anymore. We don't have to have our creative team design for this format anymore. So that's a lot of money we don't have to spend because now we know through our re-engagement planning that uh, direct mailers are out the door. They're not working, but these are, so we're spending our money.